Hello, I'm Bob Bradley. This is THE 101, Introduction to Theater and Drama Arts. Today's subject is Theater Architecture and Performance Spaces. Now, most of us probably, and certainly many of you, don't often think about what does a theater look like. Well, of course you know what a theater looks like. The theater building to most of us means what we usually call a proscenium theater. And it is so called because the proscenium arch or the opening of the frame uh, or the opening which frames the performance space is what we call a proscenium. So therefore, when you think of a theater, you walk in and you see an auditorium with seats uh, all arranged in rows uh, facing a performance space, and that performance space has a frame around it. In fact, probably 90% of the theater buildings in this country are what we call proscenium theater. Actually, this particular form of theater architecture was developed in Italy in the early 17th century, and very quickly it swept across Europe and then by the end of the century into England and became the dominant form of theater architecture, the one that we still use 300 or more, 400 years later. It is also sometimes called a fourth wall theater. And that is, if you think of this in terms of that you're looking at an interior and what you see on stage is an interior set and there are three walls. And then what happens is that fourth wall has been removed or you might think of it as being a piece of glass. And through that invisible fourth wall, the audience looks and watches and observes what goes on on stage. So let's look then uh, first uh, at this proscenium theater. And if you look at the diagram that you have that I, the, that's in front of you, uh, then I think you can begin to understand this a little better. So let's look at and talk about first what are the advantages uh, of a proscenium theater? What are the advantages of this theater that you are usually, uh, that you are used to when you come uh, to see a performance. First, all audience members are facing the same way. They're sitting in rows, one next to the other, and all audience members are looking at the same thing, at the same way, toward the stage. Therefore, within the stage picture itself, specific focus is easy to achieve. Uh, it is easy for the director to arrange in some way uh, to set up a picture in such a way that the audience knows where to look. The audience knows uh, what to see, what to listen at here. Most of the stage workings, that is all of backstage, is fairly uh, easily masked. In fact, probably most of you uh, don't even think much about what goes on backstage or what happens because all of this, all of these workings are in some way or the other with the use of curtains and draperies and the proscenium arch itself and the wall then that is beside the proscenium arch. All of this is masking for that backstage area and so therefore you don't see anything and magically things happen uh, on stage. Four, realistic interior settings look especially good behind a fourth wall. And so therefore, uh, they are always quite pleasing. And five, a detached attitude or an aesthetic distance is easy to achieve in that the audience knows where it sits. And that is, you come into the proscenium theater, you know this is where I'm sitting, and you look and you know that's where the performers are. And so therefore, there's a little sort of almost immediately a detachment that begins to take place here. The disadvantages. In many cases, a proscenium arch theater can be quite large. 
Uh, sometimes theaters can seat as many as 4,000 people. Now, if you're sitting in a proscenium theater in a 4,000-seat house, I can assure you if you are on the back row or anywhere near the back row, you are at this point a very long way from the performance space. It's an awful long way down there, and you have to peer mightily in order to see uh, what is going on. So therefore, proscenium theaters can be large, they can be difficult to see in. If you're nearer the front, then obviously this uh, particular thing is not bothersome, but it certainly can be. Good examples of this would be if you know the Fox Theater in St. Louis, which indeed does have 4,000 or more seats in it, or the Midland Theater in Kansas City, which has about 3,000 seats uh, or so uh, in it, or even uh, in Springfield, the Juanita K. Hammonds Hall for Performing Arts, which has 2,200 seats uh, in it. So if you have experienced any of those, uh, then you have some idea of the disadvantage if you are nearer the back of the auditorium. The other disadvantage is, is that in some ways this detachment which may indeed be an aesthetic one, but can in some cases become more than that, and can in some cases, the audience can find itself sort of being non-involved in the performance itself. The second uh, form of theater that I'm going to talk about is called the arena stage. Uh, it is a circle. Uh, in fact, this is probably the original performance arrangement. Uh, that is, at whatever point in some dim brain, at some point somebody said, let me show you this, then in that particular case, what happened is the audience probably sat in a circle around the individual. And in that case, then, we have this original performance space, the circle, the arena theater. If you look at the diagram, you can begin to see here what we're talking about. And of course, it's something you're fairly used to because in a much larger, uh, in a much larger case, basketball arenas uh, are usually this way, and you sit on all four sides frequently uh, in watching basketball games or watching, in some cases, football games or whatever. So this idea of being a member of an audience and sitting in the round is not an unusual one. The advantages for theater, however, uh, it does mean that in most cases the audience can be closer to the performance area and more intimacy can be achieved. Uh, one can have, if one is using all four sides and the audience is sitting all the way around, uh, then if you have 400 people each to a side, then that last row of any one side is still going to be a lot closer than it would be if you were in a uh, proscenium house and you're seating, and you're, uh, seating 1,600 people, then that back row is still going to be pretty far back. So there is an advantage there. More intimacy can be achieved. More, two, more audiences can be seated in closer proximity to the performance area. Three, the productions are usually less costly since the settings are limited in what can be put within the performance space. And that is, one cannot put huge extravagant sets into an arena stage because the audience has always got to be able to see all of the performance area all the time. So therefore, it just means that from a production standpoint, it doesn't cost as much. What are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are one, that at some point or the other, the actors will have their back turned to you for some part of the time. There's just no way an actor standing in a circle is not in some way is going to be facing one direction in whatever direction that actor is going to be facing, then obviously the back is going to be to the other. It becomes one of the things in directing an arena 
that both actors and director have to be very aware of and they have to be sure they keep making adjustments so as to keep the finding reasons why the characters can move in such a way that the back of the same actor is not always to the audience. Audience members, some audience members frequently, however, find that a disadvantage for them is that they, in looking through the performance space, can see on the other side other audience members. Now, yes, you have in a proscenium theater audience sitting beside you, and you may have people sitting in front of you, but it's different when you are looking through that performance space and you can see on the other side the faces of the other audience members, you can see their reactions, and some people find this uh, quite distracting. Three, uh, production details are limited. As I have already said, you cannot have extravagant sets, uh, and so therefore some audience people find this to be a disadvantage. They prefer to have more spectacle. They prefer having more visible evidence of a set uh, on stage than one uh, can have in an arena. This particular form has lost uh, popularity today. It was a form that was uh, greatly touted in the mid uh, 20th century and for a period in there there were a number uh, of theaters uh, that, uh, that were built uh, that are uh, in the round, uh, but uh, at the present time seldom is an arena theater built and there are only a few uh, that are uh, still being used today, perhaps the most famous of which is the arena theater uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, thrust stage. The thrust stage, this is a form uh, which has long been in existence uh, as, a theat as theatrical architecture. It was the form originally used by the Greeks in the Greek theater in the 5th century B.C. It is also the form that was used in the theater of Shakespeare uh, in the late 16th and, and early 17th century uh, before the popularity of the proscenium arch uh, became dominant. In the second half of the 20th century, this particular form uh, has begun to be uh, revived uh, and uh, one finds it uh, that there are various theaters that still are being built and using the, the thrust theater uh, as their uh, particular form. The Tyrone Guthrie in Minneapolis is perhaps one of the best known in this country, and here are two or three slides uh, for you to look at which are taken of the Tyrone Guthrie, and you can see uh, here uh, the audience, the thrust stage, and then you can also see some shots that show you going from one side uh, of sitting on one side of the audience across uh, the performance space and looking uh, at the audience on the other side. Also, if you look at this diagram, uh, then you can begin to see uh, these things. The advantages. The performer proximity to the audience is usually closer uh, than it is going to be in a proscenium theater. You can have a greater number two, you can have a greater number of seats with closer proximity to the performance area than you can in a proscenium theater. Usually, and as uh, and different from uh, the arena theater here, part of the backstage may be masked, and as you can see from that diagram, uh, and that is you have the thrust that comes out into the audience, and then uh, you've got this sort of masked area that takes place uh, up where the uh, thrust comes out of the wall itself. And that, of course, becomes then the backstage area for the performance space in some way or the other. This is a theater for speaking. It is a theater uh, which, is, uh, which was used uh, by, uh, it is the kind of theater that Shakespeare wrote his plays in and which many other of, of the great plays uh, of dramatic literature 
uh, were written for this kind uh, of theater. And when one sees a performance of these in that particular uh, surroundings, in that particular location, one begins to feel a rightness to that particular production, which in most cases cannot uh, be gained by seeing the same play on a proscenium theater. There's something special about that actor thrusting out, coming out on the thrust, thrusting out into the audience, and standing there and speaking the lines uh, of great dramatic literature. The disadvantages. The disadvantages are that, again, at some point or the other, the actors will have a back to the audience part of the time. And that is, obviously, as the, or as the actor comes forward more onto the thrust, then those people who are sitting up closer to the back wall of the theater and the back wall of the auditorium, then in that case, that actor's back is going to become more and more apparent uh, to them. So that is simply something that has to be remembered and adjusted to. And then also at certain times, the actor may get all the way out onto the thrust and then turn so that to speak to people who may be upstage uh, or above him, uh, and then at that point, then obviously, again, the actor's back is going to be, again, to some segment of the audience. Musicals are usually more difficult to perform on this kind of stage and present their own special sets of problems. It doesn't mean they can't be done. In fact, musicals can be done, and they can be done well on a thrust stage. But the thrust stage, but the musicals are basically created for a proscenium theater, and that is those people who, uh, who create musicals create the musicals with the idea that they are being created in a proscenium theater with all of the advantages, especially in terms uh, of uh, their uh, set changes and all the other things that can be done so magically uh, and without uh, and uh, with uh, outside the sight of the audience. Whereas on a thrust stage, it becomes much more difficult to do them, and one has to think through how a musical will be done quite differently from the proscenium theater. The other disadvantage, again, here is that audience members can see other individuals face front uh, in the audience as they look across the performance uh, area, and they find this distracting in some way or the other. The next form uh, of theater that I want to talk about uh, is one which is called black box or studio theater. A black box theater is a space which is, which, uh, is created in order in, uh, to give performances in, and this space has no fixed audience performance uh, performer indication. That is, it is just a room. It is a room in which a performance takes place. It is a room which is going to have a grid overhead so that lights can be put on it and the light instruments can then be so set up so as to light any area of that room. But there is no particular, in that room has no particular architectural indication or uh, space that this is where one acts, this is where one performs. Uh, in fact, it is absolutely, totally flexible. So that when the artistic team is assembled for a particular production, one of the first things they have to begin to determine is, what is the arrangement that we are going to make in this particular production between the performer and the audience? Where is the audience going to sit? Where is the performer going to act in some way? I recently saw a production in a black box theater uh, in which uh, the black box was set up and as, as if it were a long rectangle. And along the two long sides of the rectangle, the audience sat in rows and the performance space was the sort of trough that went down the middle 
between the two sides of the audience. Next time, if I go back and see another production in that particular black box theater, then in that case, there may be a totally different arrangement and it will not look that way at all. In fact, of course, this is the great advantage for black box, total flexibility. The disadvantages are going to vary from production to production, and it just depends on what the particular arrangement is. A good example of a black box theater is the Hotchner Studio Theater at Washington University uh, in St. Louis. And last, I want to talk about environmental theater. Now, this is probably a style rather than an architectural form, but it refers to a total installation in which the entire theater is given over to the production, that an environment is created for the audience to be a part of that world, as well as there is an environment over the, or part of the performance area for the performer. Cats in London and New York, Starlight Express in London, uh, the productions of the Cirque du Soleil uh, in Las Vegas, all of these are created in a total environment theater and that is the performance space is created in such a way audience and actors all live in a total environment for that particular production. It's a rather extreme form, and it's not seen a great deal because obviously it is very expensive, uh, and it's something one can do only if you think a production is going to run for a very long time. But if you ever have a chance to see any of the environmental productions, and especially the Cirque du Soleil uh, in uh, Las Vegas, I certainly encourage you to do so. Now we are going to show you four performance spaces in Springfield and talk about them. This is the Juanita K. Hammonds Hall for Performing Arts uh, on the corner of John Q. Hammonds Parkway and between Cherry and Elm Street here in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, this particular theater uh, was built uh, in the early uh, 1990s uh, and it is the largest formal theater structure uh, in Springfield. Uh, it is used for uh, bringing in uh, various productions called road shows, touring productions uh, from across the country. It is uh, in used by local organizations uh, to uh, present productions in or concerts. Uh, it is the home of the Springfield uh, Symphony Orchestra. Uh, and it is used by many other groups, uh, including the music department uh, at the SMS, on SMS campus, and once a year, uh, usually a musical production uh, by the Department of Theater and Dance. This is uh, a view that you might have uh, as you would come in from the lobby into the auditorium uh, and finding your seats here on the uh, first floor. Uh, I guess one thing that I should point out, because sometimes uh, people get confused by it, usually in most theaters, uh, the first floor, uh, which is where uh, the view you are sh looking at from now, uh, this is called the orchestra. So that consequently, if a, uh, somebody at the box office says to you, uh, do you want to sit in the orchestra? They are not referring to uh, whether you want to sit down where the uh, music instruments are, but instead uh, are referring to those seats that make up the first floor uh, of the auditorium. Now, the view which you have is you are looking here uh, at the stage house. Uh, this is a stage house as you normally don't see it, and that is it is uh, completely uh, bare. Uh, there are uh, no sets. Uh, almost uh, no, in fact, no curtains except for a few overhead. Uh, this is the stage stripped uh, bare. Uh, but it does allow you, if you look here then, uh, that one can see uh, that there is, a, there is a suggestion of, it's not a very strong one, but there is a suggestion of right and left that there is a framework that is framing this particular stage. So uh, it, it is there so as 
uh, that when there are stage productions here, that one does have a proscenium arch feeling, but it is not, it is not a strong one. It is not a predominant one uh, as it is frequently in many other theaters. One of the reasons uh, for the suggestion of, rather than being a very a strong, strongly defined proscenium arch is that this is a multi-purpose hall. Uh, and that is that in addition to uh, having theater productions in it, uh, it also uh, will have uh, orchestra concerts, uh, soloist concerts. Uh, so serving this as a music hall, it may serve as a, a dance uh, hall, also a dance presentations. So therefore, uh, the theater, the stage is arranged in such a way uh, that it can take different looks and different appearances uh, from what is needed. What you, can, what you may not be able to see, uh, but up behind me all the way upstage uh, is uh, a back, what, what looks like a back wall. Those are actually uh, acoustical panels. Uh, it's probably dark up there, but those acoustical panels will come out uh, from where they are, come into the theater house, into the stage house proper, and then can be set up in such a way uh, as to turn this into a concert hall. And that is they are acoustical panels because what they are doing is instead of allowing uh, when the orchestra, when this orchestra completely fills the stage and comes all the way on out here, instead of letting that sound bounce against, uh, bounce around or go up, that acoustical, uh, those acoustical panels then, uh, in this case, help shoot that sound out to the audience sitting uh, out there. So it's one way uh, in which this particular hall then atte attempts to accommodate uh, its various changes moving from an orchestra hall uh, into uh, a theater or whatever. The opening of this proscenium arch uh, is a fairly large one. It's about uh, 70 feet uh, in, uh, in width. Uh, and most productions, theater productions, uh, that come into this uh, auditorium will want to have something smaller. And so most productions uh, that come in here then bring in what is called a show proscenium or a false proscenium. Uh, by false meaning it's not rigid and it's not the real one. Uh, but they bring it in and they bring it in so that they can perhaps cut this opening down to say about here so that, the, so that the false proscenium would be set up in such a way uh, that actually then the show, the framework in which the show is going to be presented is going to be in a much smaller framework than what we have here. Uh, we have some uh, pictures uh, that we're going to put in here uh, and that you can look at and see so that you can see how then this which is at this point a bare stage with this great opening that you see here, how it can be manipulated uh, in such a way uh, as to be made much smaller. Uh, of course, one of the reasons why it is wanted to be made smaller is that uh, scenery has to fill whatever is your acting space, and the larger the acting space, the more scenery it is going to take. And so therefore, if the uh, this space is cut down. If this framework is cut down in some way, uh, then in that case, it means it doesn't take as much scenery uh, as it would if, they, uh, if the production was trying to fill this entire uh, framework. Uh, this is by far the largest formal uh, theater house uh, in uh, Springfield. Uh, it has approximately uh, 2,200 seats. Uh, 1,100 uh, of them are in the orchestra. Uh, another uh, nine, approximately 900 are in the first balcony. Uh, and then the second balcony, or the petite balcony as it is called, uh, has another 250 seats. This is a view uh, that most of you will probably uh, not have. Uh, and that is at this point, uh, the camera is on stage and it is now looking out into 
uh, the auditorium. Uh, so well, unless you're a performer, uh, it's not the view that you usually see. Uh, but you are now able to see how this particular theater uh, looks. Uh, it's uh, something I do encourage, however, all of you to, to learn to do, and that is whenever uh, I am in a theater, wherever I am, New York City, Minneapolis, uh, Boston, Chicago, or Springfield, Missouri, uh, if it's a theater I have not been in before, then one of the things I will always do uh, if I'm in the, uh, in the audience, uh, at some point, either before the show begins or during the intermission, I will come all the way down here to the front uh, of this uh, stage house, turn around, and then look at it just to see what it looks like. Uh, and uh, because I want to see uh, what does it look like from, uh, while I may not be on stage, but I do want to see uh, what does it look like uh, when I am standing here and at this point can see the orchestra, the mezzanine, and the petite balcony, uh, as they are called, uh, in this particular theater. Uh, also, uh, if, uh, if you look uh, to uh, the stage right, uh, up here you can see uh, the box uh, where uh, we had an earlier shot and you can begin to see then uh, what it's like looking from the auditorium up to that particular box. We are now looking at the uh, Landers Theater uh, in downtown Springfield on uh, Walnut Street. Uh, it was built uh, in uh, 1909 uh, as a house for legitimate theater, legitimate theater meaning uh, touring productions of plays, uh, most of which came from New York, but maybe other possible sources, uh, and uh, as a uh, part of the vaudeville circuit. Uh, it continued uh, then to be a theater uh, until the uh, 1920s, uh, when it began to be, uh, also continued to be a part-time theater and a movie house. And then very gradually, as, in, as is true, uh, uh, as was true of many theaters across the country uh, by the 1930s, uh, it was uh, converted into a full-time movie house uh, and remained so uh, until the late 1960s. Uh, in 1970, uh, it was bought by the community theater, uh, the Springfield Little Theater, and it then became uh, the permanent home for that organization. We are uh, now in the uh, interior uh, of the uh, Landers Theater. Uh, and it is in this theater that one uh, can see uh, the truest proscenium arch in Springfield. And that is if you look uh, here uh, to my right and then just simply go up and all the way across and follow and come down on the left, one can certainly see that there is a very definite framework and one can see that framework uh, and that it's uh, very specific uh, and in this particular case, very ornate. Now, this is very characteristic uh, of a theater that was built, as we said, in 1909. Uh, and uh, so consequently, uh, this theater has been, within the last oh, 15 years or so, uh, restored uh, with a great deal of historical accuracy. Uh, starting about 15 years ago, the Springfield Little Theater uh, organization uh, brought in some historical reconstructionists uh, from St. Louis uh, who then uh, began uh, poking around in the theater and uh, began examining records and began trying to find out what this theater looked like when it opened in 1909. And so uh, at that point, um, they... Uh, went in, got paint chips, got all kinds of things, and began to be able to say, this is what the theater was like. And so what you're seeing now is what we believe to be a fairly accurate uh, rendering of what, that the what this theater looked like uh, at the time it opened. So therefore, uh, yes, the proscenium arch was indeed uh, the gold gilt that you see here. Uh, there were indeed uh, the uh, masks uh, here, uh, lion masks that you see. 
uh, the colors that you see uh, in the proscenium arch and in the boxes uh, that are on uh, right and left uh, are indeed uh, the color. Uh, even down to the uh, seats uh, themselves, uh, the, it was discovered uh, what the original fabric looked like that covered those particular seats and uh, that uh, fabric was found. Uh, and then uh, a few years ago, uh, they even managed in digging around uh, in some of the upper reaches of the theater, found some of the original carpet uh, and, what, and uh, who had manufactured that carpet, uh, a manufacturer in uh, England. Uh, and when they uh, contacted uh, the uh, company, which was still in business in England, uh, lo and behold, order uh, on file uh, for the Landis Theater, 1909, Springfield, Missouri, uh, specifically what that carpet was and what the pattern was. Uh, and so at that point, then uh, the company went back, uh, reproduced uh, the, uh, the carpet, uh, and so the new carpet, which one uh, sees here in the theater, is a reproduction of the carpet which was here uh, in 1909. Uh, this is, uh, in many ways, this is indeed a jewel uh, of a theater. Uh, it seats approximately 400 people downstairs and about two, not quite 250 uh, in uh, its uh, balcony. Uh, and so uh, thus, uh, almost with 650 seats, uh, wherever you are in this theater, uh, it is certainly uh, one can see uh, easily. This, uh, this, this theater uh, was bought by the Springfield Little Theater uh, in uh, 1970, uh, and it is now uh, the permanent home uh, where the uh, productions of the community theater uh, are uh, presented. This is the uh, Vandevoort Center Theater. Uh, it is uh, a small theater uh, on the fourth floor uh, of the Vandevoort Center building, uh, which is on Walnut Street, uh, in fact, next door uh, to the uh, Landers Theater. Uh, the building was originally built in 1905 uh, as a Masonic temple. Uh, and the first three floors of the building uh, served uh, as uh, retail establishments and offices. It is on the fourth floor then uh, that, the, uh, that the Masons used this particular building and on one half of the floor is a ballroom uh, and on the other half of the floor was this small theater. And this is the theater in which they did their rites and their installations uh, and their uh, other kinds uh, of formal ceremonies that go on uh, within, the, uh, within the Masons. Uh, after the Masons uh, left the building, uh, it was bought by a, a developer uh, f uh, for downtown Springfield, and uh, then uh, this particular theater, or this particular space, uh, was then uh, rented out uh, starting in the mid-1990s uh, by uh, Lou Schaefer, uh, who now runs it as a uh, experimental theater, uh, as a theater that attempts to uh, offer uh, programs and productions that one might not see otherwise uh, in other uh, places in Springfield and produced by other organizations uh, in Springfield. Now, what makes this particular theater uh, quite interesting is uh, that uh, it does have a proscenium arch, uh, and that is if you look, uh, one can see there is an arch, a square uh, arch here, uh, and there is a stage uh, that, the, uh, that the Masons used, uh, and uh, which can be used uh, for theater productions. But one of the things that makes this particular theater uh, interesting is that it has some flexibilities uh, which are not otherwise available. Uh, and that is that where I'm standing here uh, on this uh, floor of the auditorium, uh, this sometimes becomes an acting space itself. And that is that productions either don't remain on stage uh, up here uh, or they come off. 
uh, and it sometimes happens uh, these uh, two rows of seats here can be can disappear completely uh, and even the uh, first or second uh, riser uh, can also be gone and so that a number of those seats can all go they can be put around the perimeters uh, so that then one can build this stage out and it can become a kind of thrust stage uh, or simply the actors can come off of the stage and uh, they can act here. Now you may say, well, why do that? Well, among other things, of course, what it does is it brings, obviously, the proximity of the performer and the audience members quite closer together. So that depending on the kind of production uh, that one might want to do, uh, then in this particular theater, there is a flexibility. Uh, one, uh, one can begin to intermingle uh, very much what is acting space because of the way the aisles come in. Uh, one can act in the aisles themselves. One can come in, make entrances and exits uh, in the aisles. Uh, or, as I said, one can come out and act in this space. Uh, and so thus, uh, one can create quite a different kind of atmosphere, uh, quite a different kind of physical relationship uh, with, between performer and audience, where if the performer is simply to stay up on stage uh, here, uh, then at that point there begins to be a very definite, uh, re a different kind of relationship that happens uh, with a performer when you're here and the audience is down there. There's a geographic uh, distance here. Uh, and to some extent, the proscenium arch uh, can, in fact, almost act as a kind of geographic barrier. But as soon as the performer begins to break through that arch, which is what the lip of this stage allows, one begins to break through that barrier, and uh, one can then come down the steps, and one can come here and here and here, and now at this point you can begin to be much closer to the audience and obviously at this point the relationship, the physical relationship and to some extent the, uh, the intimacy that can exist then uh, between the two uh, can be presented uh, quite differently in this theater from uh, almost any other uh, theater space in Springfield. So for that reason, it, it uh, is, a, as a production space, uh, is a place that uh, a lot of theater people like to work uh, because they have that flexibility that becomes a part of the decision when one begins to d decide on doing a production, then the director begins to make some decisions about what kind of relationship, physical relationship, geographic relationship, do I want to establish between the audience and the uh, performer. Uh, and this theater space opens up possibilities uh, that otherwise would not be available. Uh, this is uh, Coger Theater uh, in Craig Hall on the SMS campus. Uh, and uh, it was built in the uh, late uh, 1960s uh, and in, number, in many ways uh, pretty much reflects a number of the thoughts of that day. Uh, and that is, it is a proscenium arch theater. And if you look, uh, you can see uh, that here uh, over there is the uh, wall or the arch going up. Uh, and then there's a, a concrete uh, pillar across the uh, top. Uh, and then there's a, the same thing over on the other side. And then, of course, the uh, masking curtain, uh, which can lower in and out uh, and adjust uh, than the height of the uh, arch in whatever way. So thus, when one wants to form the square, uh, the framework, uh, and the stage picture then goes completely behind uh, and upstage uh, here, then at that point uh, we have indeed this very definite physical uh, arch, or in this case, a, a square frame uh, which uh, we uh, look at the production through. But uh, in this particular case, uh, this does have uh, a very large apron on it. Uh, this can be, this is a hydraulic lift. Uh, it can become a stage, uh, it can become an orchestra pit uh, so that with uh, the push of a button, uh, it may uh, go down 
uh, to a lower level and at that point become that. Or as it frequently can be, uh, it can become a part of the stage action itself. Uh, and if you look right uh, and left uh, in this direction, you can see that there are some side stages uh, that sort of come out here and to some extent sort of surround the audience. And that is, these are all audience seats here. So this was a kind of compromise uh, that was made at the point it was designed. Uh, and that is, instead of just having uh, a, a proscenium arch theater and nothing else and that framework, then there is an attempt here at least to get more acting space that comes out, gets closer uh, to the audience. Uh, and so that one, especially is when one is doing, uh, say, the plays of Shakespeare, uh, and in that particular case, uh, you know, we, we know that his plays were written for uh, a stage that thrust out uh, into the audience uh, and that then the audience sort of sat around. So to some extent, to uh, give us some idea of that particular feeling, uh, then this theater was designed uh, to, uh, to capture that. So uh, it's, uh, while yes, it's mainly a proscenium theater, uh, it also has at least certain characteristics that allow it to be used and to certainly to bring the performer uh, and the audience members uh, into some close, uh, proxi a close proximity uh, to each other. We are at uh, the SMSU Summer Tent Theater. This is a totally temporary situation that we're looking at. During most of the year, this is a concrete pad. And then about the middle of May, the tent is erected, and then as soon as the tent is erected, everything is moved in, and quite literally, everything. Everything you see here in the tent is something which is brought in, which is a temporary uh, arrangement so as to turn this area into a playing space, a performance space, a space which in fact has become uh, a tradition and a favorite uh, with the people uh, in Springfield. The tent seats, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 to 360 people. This uh, stage that I am standing on is basically a platform stage. That is, it is not, but it is a platform stage. Uh, it has here on the right and the left masking pieces, uh, that is, masking in terms of keeping uh, the audience from seeing what goes on backstage so that the audience can see only uh, what happens up here uh, on the stage, but then over in this creates wings, that is the offstage space, creates wings uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the actors uh, so that they can make their uh, entrances and, uh, and exits uh, here. Uh, one of the unquestionable reasons why uh, tent uh, is as uh, well received and as a favorite as it is, is that there is a very intimate situation. Uh, and that is at this point, uh, you are looking at uh, from the viewpoint of if you were sitting on the back row uh, of the tent. Uh, and obviously you are not very far from the performer. So therefore, there's a wonderful relationship uh, that can happen here uh, between the performer uh, and the audience. And those who are down here on the, on the front row, uh, almost uh, with their uh, chin uh, on the edge of the stage, uh, certainly uh, they are uh, right in uh, the, uh, the performance here. 